All right, we'll try this again. So this is the, the final talk of my series of lectures. We've seen various parts of uh, things that touch upon set addition or sum sets. Uh, in this last talk, I want to combine a few of these topics together along with a new concept, which is fairly important in the area. It's called additive energy. So we have our sum set A plus B inside our abelian group. And now let's define the additive energy of the sum set to be all these ordered pairs of the form, well, A, B, A prime, B prime, and A cross B cross A prime, oops, cross B, which have the same sum. So we're basically looking at, you know, there are lots of possibilities of cho choice of A inside A, B inside B, another one A prime and A and B prime and B that and they may have similar sums. So this is sort of counting the number of relations. So let's uh, look into this a little more. Um, let's note that, just say A, B, A, B is an element of this additive energy for every A inside A, B inside B. So that means this has size at least, well, A times B. In fact, we can, uh, there's various ways to view this additive energy. Let's look at this one over here. This is really the sum over all elements inside our group. The number of representations of it as an element of the sum set squared. Uh, why can we think about this? Well, maybe view. Uh, Pretend you have a graph on A cross B vertices. And now pretend you draw a directed edge between any two vertices if they have the same sum, the coordinates are the same. So we're, we're including basically double edges. Every edge is repeated twice, and there are also loops. And what does this graph basically look like? Well, we have all, the vertices are all the elements of this Cartesian product A cross B. So we have little points. And for every element that's inside the sum set, And we have various points that are equal in sum to A to Z, but if a pair, we have two pairs that are both, three pairs that say are equal to have Z as sum, then, well, this is a transitive relation. You know, when we look at all the pairs, we're going to actually get a click. So however, if we have all the representations, however many there are, these are all various ordered pairs, and these two have the same sum, and these two have the same sum, well then of course, the two over there have to have the same sum. This is a transitive relation. If this, or the coordinate sums are the same, everything, we get a giant click. And since we include double edges and loops, it has sides R squared. So that's where this is coming from over there. 
one way of looking at additive energy. It's not the only way. Uh, we also have, say, this is really if we summed over all x inside g, our a minus a and our b minus b of x. And so what's going on here? Well, if we have a plus b being a prime plus b prime, Well, that's the same thing as basically a minus a prime being b prime minus b prime. All right, so having these sums, if we run over all possible a's and b's, this is the same thing as looking at common differences between the two sets. And we have this many choices for, if this is a fixed element z, there are this many choices for the left side, which can be paired up with that many choices for the right side. And so we multiply them together and add up, and we get all the possible possibilities. And another important relation if we change the, the sign on one of the sums, it doesn't change the energy. Of course, why again? This is a for the same reasons. If we have a plus b equals a prime plus b prime. That corresponds to a minus b prime being equal to a prime minus b. And sort of by the same kind of relation that we just change the sign, we're, we're counting the same relations more or less. So the additive energy is, is going to basically loosely tie to the size of the sum set, right? Well, this is sort of counting how many relations we have. If the sum set is very large, we would expect uh, the energy to be small. And if, the, if we have high energy, we have lots of relations, and the, the sum set should be, should be small, at least in some rough sense. It's not going to correspond perfectly. But in some rough sense, uh, the, the energy and the, the size of the sum set should be tied together a little bit, at least. This is kind of an important concept, that basically having high energy or in, corresponding to low, uh, small sum sets, or vice versa. Uh, which actually gets used in the proof of Freiman's theorem and other places in, uh, with sum sets. And it's not a perfect correlation, because you can see over here that it, the sum set and the different sets sometimes could have different sizes, but they have the same additive energy. The, the distribution can be different. But it's a rough way of getting at the, you know, the size of the set. And to sort of indicate that, here's one basic sort of result. The size of the sum set is at least cardinality of a squared b squared divided by the total amount of additive energy. So here we can at least make it precise in some quantitative sense in one direction. If this additive energy is getting a very small, this is going to be huge. Of course, it can't be too small. It's always at least a times b, so you're, you're never going to get more than the trivial bound there. It's not possible. But as the added energy gets very um, small, this gets fairly big. Why is this true? I just kind of uh, sketch the proof. It's basically just a calculation, or there are various ways to view it. I mean, we have this additive energy we want to find. Basically, we want to Find this lower bound for this. So we're distributing, we're assembling, taking vertices. If we view this a viewpoint over here, we have a fixed number of vertices. that are being distributed into a fixed number of clicks. A lower bound for E. Oh, we're just swapping the direction. I mean, we bring this over here and bring this down over here, we'll be in the same direction. 
yeah, it, it's a uh, fixed number of vertices A being distributed into a fixed number A plus B of clicks. Of sizes, I don't know, x1, x2, up to x a plus b. All right, so we have the sum of these xi's. That's all the vertices. And the sum of the xi's squared, that's the additive energy. And we basically just have a constrained minimization problem. All right, we, you, however you want to view it, you can uh, see that the best way to do this is to equally distribute all the points. If we just sort of allow this to be even just real numbers, they sort of uh, smooth things out. The best way to minimize uh, this quantity over here, the sum of squares, given that we have a fixed sum over here, is to distribute the points equally. So we have all right, so we and they're all then we had the same size that have this size over here, and we get a plus b times a times b all over a plus b squared, and that's the lower bound. Right, of course the we're not doing the details of the calculation, but this is, this is nothing complicated going on here. So it's a basic lower bound. And I'm going to put down a couple consequences of this uh, on the board over here, which we're going to make use of. So here's a little lemma. Say we have A and B inside our group G. We'll assume that A has the larger size, B is at least K. We're going to assume that the number of representations of every element is at most k outside of some set t. And get a lower, lower bound of this form over here. We can need a to be at least t2. All right, anyways, don't worry too much about the exact statement. We're going to actually use a corollary of this. But the idea is here that when we we're doing this additive energy, we, the way to minimize it was to distribute the points equally. Over here, we have a restriction that pre prevents that from happening. Here, the added energy of A minus B, well, we have lots of points that have bounded. They don't have that many elements in the click. So it's, we're going to be able to improve that estimate over there. We could run all this through and see what we get for a result. And it would be something that looks like this bound over here. So we're just going to, we can't distribute equally because we're, our hypotheses prevent that from happening. So we get a slightly better bound. And we write down what comes out of it. And the corollary we're going to need is this. Let's suppose A is bigger than B, which is at least 3. I'm going to let T be all the elements that translate B into A. I'm going to assume that X plus B intersect A is less than or equal to 1 for every X not inside T. And the hypothesis is if T is at most the max of 1 and A minus B, 
Well, then that means the sum set is at least a plus b elements. Again, this is just a calculation and using the previous lemma over there. Uh, I'm not going to do the calculation, but we're going to use this bound over here. Remember, this is a special case, more or less k equals 1, and this result over here, we could derive it then afterwards with a bit of a calculation. So now, let's make use of some of these estimates. And this book's a little different because don't forget that this is really, I'll remind you over here, how we relate intersections to representation. And this is going to come up in the, our next proof because we started off with Canazer's theorem and then we moved on to this uh, more involved generalization, Kepperman structure theorem. And we didn't give a proof of that. And I, I'm not going to give a proof of that. It's a, it'll be a very long proof. But I want to give a, a proof of a sort of a very simple, simplified version of that, the prime case. There's a special name for that because it was proven earlier. It's called Vosper's theorem. So now our subsets are going to live inside z mod pz with p prime. And let's uh, avoid the, the, the outlying cases. I'm going to assume that a and b have at least two elements, and that their sum set is critical and is missing at least two elements. So we have over here this key critical pair condition. And we know that basically by Kepperman's theorem that it would have to either be, well, there's this quasi-periodic dis description, but since we have a prime order group, we can't have a non-trivial quasi-period. So it has to be an elementary pair. And if it corresponded to an elementary pair of type 1, well, one of the sets would have size 1. It's a very simple case where equality can hold, so we're just not even considering this, this statement. And if it was equal to all the way up to p, well, then we just have enough elements that we guarantee it be the pigeonhole principle. Another very easy case. P minus 1 is also fairly simple. I'm just skipping it uh, to save some time. The only remaining case is the, the type 2 pairs, where A and B are arithmetic progressions of common difference. And of course, that also means the the sum set is 2, because right, if you take two arithmetic progressions, you take their sum set, you get another arithmetic progression with the same difference. They might think it's not worth mentioning, but we're going to need this fact in the proof. So this will be sort of a simplified version of a proof of Kepperman's theorem. We're, we're going to It'll have some of the key ideas in it with uh, being short and simple enough that we can present it a little quicker. All right, so let's start off with uh, a simple case. We have this statement over here, where to begin? What if we begin with uh, the first case? B is an arithmetic progression. So we have half the result. We, we need to show that both A and B are arithmetic progressions. We assume that we already know one of the sets is an arithmetic progression. That should help us. So let's, let's do this case. Let's, with difference D, say. And if we do this, we can decompose A into maximum arithmetic progressions of difference D. So our goal is to basically show that m equals 1, that it's actually just a single arithmetic progression. So, you know, 
Could be that A has a form. Here's one. There's A1, and then there's some various gaps afterwards. And then there's more, another arithmetic progression here. Maybe I'll just draw them as straight lines. Then there's more gaps afterwards, and then more straight lines. There's A1, A2, A3, and so on. So there's always a progression followed by a gap, which is another progression followed by, you know, another portion of the set followed by another gap. And this goes around in a circle because we're on the ZP. Now, what happens when we add B to the set? We're adding it to each AI. So when we add B to AI, well, one of two things happens. We either get, maybe call this one B1. This is the, the gaps after A1. And this one we'll call B2. So we're going to let B1 just be the space between A1 and A2 if we order this cyclically. So we can do this. This is just, you know, literally here's the last term in A1, and then it starts up afterwards here. So we, if we order things in this order over here, then we're either going to get everything that's afterwards, right? The progression, maybe it overlaps, it runs all the way down, or we'll get B plus A1 minus one elements, right? When we add the two progressions, we're gonna extend to get a longer progression. Either we extend past this interval, and we get all the elements that we're missing in that sort of gap, or we don't, and we get the whole sum set A1 plus B1 as if we were in the integers. Well, we have a, an issue over here because This can't happen every single time. Or this happens every single time all the gaps get filled up. Like every single one is gone, and that would imply that we had A plus B equaling P, the entire group. We don't have that. It's strictly less than the order of the group. So it has to happen that at some point they get a, b minus one extra elements that get added to the set A. But that's all the extra elements were allowed because the whole sum sets A plus b minus one. So if this is, say, A1 where we gain b minus one elements, for every other gap we get at least one element because either we get the whole gap or at least b minus one because b is at least two. So we can't have any other gaps. So there's the, the first case. That's case one. So we just realized we can decompose A in this special way, and it's actually we, nothing really as difficult going on here. But at least we have one case done, and that does cover a special case when, say, the smallest set is size two, because then it's automatically an arithmetic progression. So let's assume A is the bigger set. So we can assume B is at least three. And we're going to proceed by induction. It's going to be a double induction in this uh, version. So I'm going to write it like this. So our first parameter is the cardinality of A plus B. So that means if we have another sum set that satisfies our hypotheses with a strictly smaller cardinality, I assume we know the theorem for it. And amongst all sum sets that have the same cardinality, if the minimum cardinality in the summons goes down by anything, I assume we also know it. So this is kind of a two-step induction. And in the, we keep dropping down, the very bottom we'd ever hit will be when the case this, uh, when the set says smallest size two. But it, basically, we don't even need to, we just need to do the base cases that we'll run into. And that one's already done. So let's, let's go with this. Now,
if x is not inside A, let's look at A union x plus B. Right, we have the Cauchy Davenport theorem. This says this is at least the minimum of P in A union x plus B minus 1. which in turn equals the minimum of P and A plus B, which is strictly bigger than that of A plus B. Doesn't matter what X we use, as long as it's not inside A. So you might remember when I defined this notion of saturation, right? If we could add an, a new element to our set and it didn't increase the sum set, then it wasn't saturation. But if no matter whatever new element we try, try to add to A, it always increased the size of the sum set, then it was saturated. And the same argument shows that B is also saturated. And whenever we have saturated sets, we have this equality. We know that B minus A plus B inverse equals negative A inverse, and A minus A plus B inverse equals negative B complement. Remember, the bar is the complement. So if we take B and we add to the complement of A plus B minus uh, everything inverted, we get the complement of A and, and the same thing over here. We have uh, new equalities, which we're going to take advantage of. Not just yet, but soon. By the way, these are ones you would use to do the case when it's equal to p minus 1. All right, so we still need some way to use the induction hypothesis. Right, right now, we realize that the case when it's an arithmetic progression was fairly easy. That handles the case too. We realize, we notice that everything is saturated. A few basic observations. We need somewhere to, to generate uh, the induction hypothesis. And we're going to use something that's uh, a trick that goes back to actually to Cauchy. I think, yeah, I think it was Cauchy originally, although it was probably, a, goes better in the better name of the Dyson transform. Uh, we're going to, well, let's, let's make a little space over here and make some observations. Let's just consider this over here for a intersect b plus a plus uh, not a plus b a union b. All right. Well, this is kind of completely obvious. Or I mean, this is either this is inside. You take an element here; it's either an a and b, and an element over here; it's in both a and b. So regardless, it's it's paired up with something in a and with something in b, and so it lives inside the sum set over there. And the cardinality. by include and exclusion is the same. And of course, we can do this with any translate of B. You know, just, it's just, we know everything is translation invariant, so we can always replace B with any translate and do the same trick afterwards. And we'd have the same thing coming up afterwards. won't change anything. So here's our sneaky idea. We're going to try and replace the pair A and B with the pair A intersect B, A union B. And we're, we're allowed to translate B however we like to do this. So we, we, we have a bunch of choices. We're going to appropriately translate B, replace B with the translate, and then do this intersection over here. And now the, the size of the subset won't get any smaller, and the cardinality won't get any bigger. We're almost in, a, in line to apply this hypothesis as long as we can guarantee that the minimum size is at least two, 
and the maximum size got smaller. So what we need We need some element x such that x plus b, when we intersect it with a, well, this had better be at least 2, so we can use the strong adduction hypothesis, because the set's supposed to have size at least 2. And it better have size at most b minus 1, otherwise we can't apply the induction hypothesis. But if we do this, then we'll be in good shape to use the induction hypothesis with x plus b intersect a and, and x plus b union a. So that's our goal. We just need to find this x that's going to work. And that's where this lemma is going to come in over here. This additive energy is going to sort of give us this, this set. So let's look at the upper bound. x plus b intersect a. Having cardinality b. Well, this just means that x plus b is contained inside a. Right? Because the only way to get the full cardinality. Get every element has to be of the trans that needs to be contained inside a. So let's give a, a set to all those bad x's. I'm going to call it t. These are no good because they, they won't reduce the size of the minimal cardinality sum set, uh, sum end. And so we, we couldn't use those x's. And that corresponds precisely with uh, this set over here, t, inside the corollary we're going to use. Now, it would also be bad if the intersection had size at most 1. So our really bad case is assume that x plus b intersect a is at most 1 for all x that aren't inside t. This is the bad case, where we couldn't use the induction trick we're, we're intending to use. Well, look, there's the statement here. And we also have a being at least b being at least 3. We have everything we need to apply this statement over here, except t. We need a bound on t. We need an upper bound for the size t. Let's get one. So let's observe this definition. t is all the things that when we add it to b, we live inside a. So t plus b is contained inside a, right? because this is holds for every x inside t. It's just the definition of the sum. So we take anything in t, we add it to b, we live inside a. All right, so that means the cardinality of t plus b is at most the cardinality of a. And this, well, we can assume t is at least 1, otherwise we're done. Because right, if it was at most 1, then we, we'd be happy. So let's assume that's at least 2. It's supposed to be too big. Therefore, it's not empty. And Cauchy Davenport tells us this is at least t plus b minus 1. Remember, this is less than a plus b, which is less than b minus 2. All right, we're almost there, because if we just move the inequalities around, we get t being at most a minus b plus 1. Very frustrating. We're only off by 1 from the, this trivial estimate. And if you went to look and see if you could improve the calculations, they wouldn't quite work over there. So it's a little frustrating. But we shouldn't be too frustrated. <laughs> because if this fails, let's just we have to have equality everywhere.
What's that going to mean? Well, that means t plus b minus 1 equals the cardinality of t plus b, which equals the cardinality of a. And that latter one means that t plus b has to equal a because it's contained in it. Right? So if it has the same size as inside it, it's got to be the same set. Well, this is nice. t is at least 2. And a is strictly less than a plus b, which is less than or equal to p minus 2. So we can apply the induction hypothesis to t plus b. That means t, b, and t plus b equals a plus b are all orthogonal regressions of common difference. All right, we're almost there. But remember that negative a plus a plus b complement equals b complement. I just I had raised that before. We got that from the, the saturability. Hmm? I'm sorry? T plus b is equal to a, a. No, we're already done, so I'm already jumping ahead. This is simpler here, so we don't need this at the moment. We're going to do that afterwards, though. Done. So this never happens. That one case of equality where we didn't quite get the bound good enough, we realized we can apply the induction hypothesis to this special set, t plus b, and everything falls through. So that means we actually get this over here. t has to be at most 1 or a minus b. And we can apply the that little corollary there to say that there exists an x that does the trick. And now I'm going to retranslate everything so that x is just equal to 0, to make notation simpler. OK, we found our desired element. So we have A intersect B at least 2 less than B. We have all these equalities over here. That means we can apply the induction hypothesis to A intersect B plus A, A union B. Right, it can't have size more than A plus B, so we're good. And at least one of the, the smaller cardinality went down strictly. And it's still at least two. So everything is in good shape. And of course, since it's at most the size of a plus b, and a plus b was at most p minus 2, then it's something that is also p minus 2. So we have all the hypotheses we need. This means, oh, well, hold on. We need the, the first that it has equality, but uh, Cauchy-Davenport theorem implies that right, this is at least this bound over here, which is just a plus b minus 1. And this is at least the sum set, which also has cardinality plus b minus 1. So we actually have equality everywhere. 
plus A intersect B plus A union B equals A plus B. And the cardinalities work out. That was the last bit we needed to apply the induction hypothesis because it actually has to be a critical pair to, be, to satisfy the induction hypothesis. So the induction hypothesis says that now A intersect B, A union B, and A plus B are all arithmetic progressions of common difference. Now, of course, you might be misled to try and focus on A intersect B and A union B at first because, well, you know the intersections in arithmetic progression, the unions in arithmetic progression, maybe work with that. But we're going to use that simpler trick involving duality to get to the, the, the end a little bit easier. All right. Uh, let's see. Plus A equals... There was that little equality we had from the, the, the saturation equality. And we know that when we have saturation, if the original sum set was critical to begin with, the saturated, the, the, the flip, the dual is also critical. Remember, the additive constant is the same when we have uh, saturated pairs and we've, we change over here. If this is plus r, then this one over here is still plus r. That was from that, that lecture we had a few, a few days ago. So if this one was negative one, this is negative one. In other words, we actually have a trio of critical pairs, and here's one of the other ones in the trio. And it involves a plus b complement. Now, the complement of an arithmetic progression in Zp is an arithmetic progression. And so is when we flip it upside down with the negative sign. In fact, they all have the same difference. We're not doing anything really except uh, taking the complement and changing the sign from D to D minus. And it has size at least two, because that's P minus the size of A plus B. Well, there's our hypothesis. We're finally using it. There's at least two elements there. And this set over here is missing at least two elements. So let's apply the induction hypothesis means that A, A plus B complement and B complement are all arithmetic progressions. Not the, so the case one. Right, we don't know about the induction hypothesis, but we have the, the base case. The case we did at the very beginning, this one's an arithmetic progression. So that means a and negative AB are both arithmetic regressions of common difference. And of course, that means A and B are two. And because we complement, change the negative sign, doesn't change the difference. And we're done. That's the end of the proof. 
So that's a little taste as to how one can go about proving Kepperman's theorem. I mean, there's lots of complications we didn't have to deal with because things were prime. There were no subgroups. Uh, so things simplify greatly in this proof. But it's still, you can modify this proof and get it to work to prove Kepperman's theorem you know, with a lot more effort. Of course, you might notice that we, we made it, took advantage of this complementation trick with this duality for saturated pairs. You might worry that in an, for G being an infinite group, you couldn't do this because you get infinite summons. But you can reduce the finite case, the infinite case down to the finite case uh, by some arguments. And so it's really enough to handle the finite case using some, some appropriate isomorphisms. And there are always some other things that come up in the proof because there will be possible stabilizers and Knazer's theorem needs to be used. So things do get longer and more complicated. That's why there wasn't really quite enough time to present the whole proof. But this is some of the key ideas that get used there. Now, in the remaining 15 or so minutes, I'd like to close by talking about uh, an open conjecture that kind of ties together a bunch of these uh, topics. So right now we've seen Vosper's theorem, which you can sort of view as a, a special case in the 3K minus 4 theorem for the integers. Right? This, this says that if we're below this sort of, if these were integer subsets, right? for instance, we could always take inner subject modulo a very large P, we know by the 3K minus 4 theorem that equality only holds when A and B are arithmetic progressions of common difference. So this is a very special case in the prime of 3K minus 4 theorem for groups of prime order. One could wonder, is there a version of the 3K minus 4 theorem in more generality for groups of prime order? And there are lots of partial results to this end, but there's still no final conclusion. So here is the, uh, I'll call it the critical pair conjecture. Or maybe the R critical pair conjecture, whatever. So P is a prime. And A and B are subsets of Z mod PZ. I need to, I'll call it G. And let's suppose that there are some set of size A plus B plus R. And I'm going to slightly simplify this. You might remember in the 3K minus 4 theorem, there's that delta constant that says that normally you can improve it by 1, except in the case when things are translates. For simplicity, I'm just going to avoid the delta here. It can't be too big. It should be at most P minus R minus 4. And A and B, and R should be at most these two elements over there, which you could phrase alternatively, A is at least R plus 4, B is at least R plus 4, and the complement of A plus B is at least A R plus 4. Then that means there are progressions PA PB and PC, such that A is contained inside PA, B is contained inside PB, A plus B complement is contained inside PC, and the, the difference is the number of gaps in all these cases. is at most r plus 1. And of course, we, we have this trio because we, uh, for such periods, so you can basically reduce down to the, the saturation case where you have these, if you have a plus b being a critical pair, then you could always take that flip that involves negative a plus b complement. That will also be a critical pair. So you have these three sets, a, b, and negative a plus b complement that are all sort of in a trio formation. And they are all completely symmetrical with regards to the hypotheses. And the, the, the same difference should work for all of them. So this is open. And there are, there are lots of special cases for parameters. And, and under ma many circumstances, this is true. Uh, we don't have so much time to talk about all of them. But the general open case is still open.
Uh, maybe rather than talking about all the different variations that are actually known for this theorem, and there, there are quite a few, uh, why don't I give out an alternative formulation of this that kind of emphasizes the symmetry a little better? So we now have A, B, and C all being inside our group Z mod PZ. P is prime. We're going to assume that this is not equal to everything. And just make sure. Each of the individual sets has size at least r plus 4. And in total, let's see, we have a, we have p minus r elements. We get the same conclusion in this case. A is inside PA, B is inside PB, C is inside PC. It looks a little bit uh, different, but let's uh, show how quickly how one of them implies the other one. Let's consider this theorem here if we take C equals negative A plus B complement. Then we have A plus B minus A plus B complement, and we showed earlier this that doesn't contain zero. We, always, we know that always happens. There's no way to represent this. If you take a set and subtract it from its complement, you can't get zero inside there. So that means this is not equal to G. And if we have the hypotheses of this conjecture over here, then that means A is at least R plus 4, B is at least R plus 4, and A plus B complement, that's P minus A plus B, which is at least R plus 4 by this assumption over here. And the sum of all the, the elements, A plus B plus C, that's A plus B plus A plus B complement. Looks like A plus B plus P minus A plus B, uh, which is A plus B plus P minus A minus B minus R, which is B minus R. So if we knew the second ver version, we could plug in that. We see that we have the, with this special case, C equals negative A plus B complement. We plug it in the second version, and that would give us the re desired arithmetic progressions. And the reverse isn't so hard to, to see there. You can actually do the other, the other implication also follows by a uh, not so hard trick. Maybe uh, let's just conclude with talking about this condition over here with that third set. Because remember, that didn't come up originally in the formulations of the 3K minus 4 theorem that I talked about in the previous lectures. And there we only had two sets, A and B. There was no third set C. Because, of course, if we took A plus B complement, it was an infinite set. But there's still a, for, a, a way to interpret this inside the integers without even passing to infinite summons. Right, this is saying that the, the complement is contained inside an arithmetic progression. So just uh, take the complement of both those. All right, so let's see what happens.
That means P complement is contained inside negative A plus B. Or negative P C complement is contained inside A plus B. And of course, that's an arithmetic progression of the same difference. And if you do the calculation, it has size A plus B. Well, at least. We just do the complement that falls from the, this bound over here being at most R plus 1. I don't, we don't have quite time to do it, but it's, it gives us at least A plus B minus 1. And that would make sense inside the integers, because just, it means the sum set, you know, the complement is contained inside a, an arithmetic progression with not too many gaps, is equivalent that by taking complements, basically, to the sum set containing a long length arithmetic progression. And that is also known for the 3k minus 4 theorem. I just didn't have the time to mention it before. So this conclusion about there existing a long length progression inside the sum set that assigns at least the sum of the cardinalities minus 1 under the hypotheses of the 3k minus 4 theorem, that's also known. Um, a more recent result, but it is, it is known. And this conjecture still stays open, although there are many cases of it that are resolved. Uh, thank you. I hope you enjoyed the lectures.